Good evening and a warm welcome to you all. My name is David Hewan, and from all of us at Garrett Publishing, it's such a delight that you could join us tonight. I'm so excited to bring these Zoom sessions to you over the next four weeks to help you break open the word for young people. Before I introduce Professor Claire Johnson and hand over to her, there are some important items, if I may. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I join you from. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I also extend my respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples from the many lands on which you join us from all around the country. Tonight's sessions, and indeed all sessions in the coming week, offer educators accredited professional development hours. Certificates that will offer you these hours will be issued by the Australian Catholic University and Garrett Publishing after all four weeks have been completed. There are as always, some administrative requirements, however. Hours can only be gained viewing these sessions live. To ensure tonight's hour is registered, I would ask you to use the chat function in Zoom. I would ask you to send a message and include your name and your email. Ideally, these would match the name and email that you registered for the sessions. The chat function allows you to communicate with everybody or me privately if you prefer. I'm just registered as Garrett Publishing. The evening Zoom will be recorded, so you'll be able to revisit Claire's insights um, later. However, we cannot accredit you for any hours if you only watch the video. I do apologise, but as there is no singular PD recognised system across the country, we have to work on an honour system. We'll also have the video up on Garrett's website in coming days, and we'll send a link out to you for the recording. Um, we have the chat function, and Claire is happy to take questions um, uh, later on in the session. Um, feel free to log those questions um, or any that you have as you go. Um, we've allowed some time to answer as many as we can. We can't guarantee we'll get all questions answered tonight, but hopefully over the four weeks, we'll get pretty darn close. Claire Johnson is a professor of liturgical studies and sacramental theology, and is the director of the ACU Center for Liturgy. She's taught liturgical studies, sacramental theology, preaching, liturgical music, and introductory theology at the University of Notre Dame in the US, Michigan State University, the University of Notre Dame over in Fremantle, and of course, ACU. Claire's been awarded her teaching excellence with undergraduate and postgraduate students, and is an experienced presenter of interactive online learning. So we're in for a treat tonight. Tonight's session is also a cause of celebration. Claire's worked hard over recent years with the Garrett Publishing team to prepare three titles that celebrate the lectionary. So I would like to publicly thank Claire right now for her dedication, because these books and her work is a gift to the church here in Australia. Enough from me uh, until the end. Uh, Claire, over to you. David, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, with you for this session. And thank you very much for all of your work in organising our sessions together over the coming weeks. I'm really delighted to be joining you all from Melbourne, even though it looks like I'm in the stars at the moment, but that was the background that was um, most appropriate, I thought, for tonight. So thank you so much for being a part of this, this short course. I thought I would start by sharing my PowerPoint, because otherwise um, I will not be able to show you what I was going to show you. David, I think it's saying to me that the um, participant screen sharing needs to be enabled by you if that's okay. We'll just wait a second so that he can do that for us. Oh, there we go. Well done. Thank you. And there we go. Hopefully you can now see that screen there. I thought we might start tonight with a, a little prayer. That's actually one of the prayers that is from the Celebrating the Lectionary book. 
books. Um, and it's in fact the prayer for this week, which is the 19th week of ordinary time. So let's begin with our little prayer together. Lord Jesus Christ, in your holy face, we see the face of God. Help us to keep our eyes always fixed on you so that in everything we do, we may be pleasing to you. May we love you and follow you all the way to God's kingdom, where you live and reign with God the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. These little prayers you'll find in every session that, that has have been written for the Celebrating the Lectionary books. They're very helpful to have little prayers like this up your sleeve. Sometimes you're called upon at the last minute to provide a prayer for the start of a meeting or um, you, know, you want to do a class prayer at the start of the day and you forgot to prepare it. Well, there are lots and lots of prayers like this throughout the Celebrating the Lectionary books. So I hope that you can find in them something that will appeal to you and appeal to your students and really help them to focus on one particular idea. Um, in this case, it's, it's all about helping us keep our eyes on God so that everything we do is pleasing to God, which is a wonderful sentiment to be cultivating. So I hope this is one of the ways in which these resources can make your lives easier, which is essentially what they're for. No, they're for education, but making your lives easier is always good too. It also doesn't hurt to repeat these prayers. Um, through repetition, the main ideas of the prayers make their way into our hearts and our minds and our actions, ideally. So repeating them is not a problem. So as David indicated, I am one of the authors who contributed entries to the Celebrating the Lectionary books um, that we're exploring in our short course together over these next few weeks. I also adapted all of the US authored material for the Australia and New Zealand context. So it is my pleasure to provide you with an orientation, not only to these books, but also to one of our key liturgical books, which is their subject. And of course, that key liturgical book is the lectionary. In some ways, the lectionary is the Jan Brady of the liturgical books. Um, just like in the 1970s TV show, The Brady Bunch, the attention always seemed to focus on the prettier older sister, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Um, poor old Jan, the middle sister, sort of got a bit overlooked. Well, among the liturgical books um, of our Catholic tradition, the poor old lectionary seems to get overlooked while the focus always seems to be on its newer companion volume, Missile, Missile, Missile. So for the next four weeks, we are going to turn our attention away from the Missile and to the lectionary so that it can have some, some very special attention. Back to the Missile for a second though. While the Missile is the liturgical book um, which guides the celebration of the Mass as a whole, the Lectionary is the liturgical book we use for the first main section of the Mass, the Liturgy of the Word. We can't celebrate Mass without the Lectionary. We used to use a book called the Sacramentary and this of course was a combination of the Lectionary and the Missile together in the one book. And because of the publication of the Missile in 2011 in Australia, it came out, was implemented in 2011. Um, so we have a new Missile, but we don't yet have a new Lectionary, though there is one on the horizon. So they remain separate books for the moment. The Missile, which is the key book for celebrating Mass and the Lectionary, which guides us in the Liturgy of the Word. So the lectionary is the liturgical book that contains the sequence of readings from sacred scripture that are to be proclaimed aloud in public worship. So there's something very special about these readings in that we call them, we understand them to be, tradition has taught us that they are inspired, that they are the word of God, and that when they are proclaimed, God is in our midst speaking to us. So they're very sacred, they're very special, and so we treat them with the greatest of respect. The readings are interesting in that they're related to the seasons and the feasts of the liturgical year, and they're important to the church's self-understanding. We rehearse them, we reflect on them, we're shaped by these stories that we hear proclaimed in the liturgy. These have an impact on us. They shape our identity because they're our stories, the stories of us as the people of God. So when we hear these stories rehearsed in our midst, they become a part of us ideally. They shape us, they form us, they teach us our identity, they teach us who we are, or if we're not currently there, they teach us who we're called to be. So these stories are very sacred, very special for many, many reasons, and the lectionary is where they're housed. Lectionaries are really helpful. They provide us with continuity across 
the seasons of the year and across the years, in fact, that we celebrate the three volumes of the lectionary. Um, and they give us uniformity across all of the different communities of our church, across all of the different countries where the liturgy is celebrated, the Catholic liturgy. Um, and they help us to be united. Some, some of our lectionary is shared with other Christian denominations as well. We're not quite as on, on target with each other anymore um, as we used to be when we had the revised common lectionary. We're sort of moving in slightly different directions, but there's certainly still a pattern of readings among many of the mainstream Christian denominations where we're reading very similar things at the same time. That's not uniform, but you know there is some continuity there across traditions too. Lectionaries are actually books that are created by churches. Um, liturgist Kate Dooley says the scriptures are inspired, but lectionaries are not. So theoretically, the church could actually decide to create an entirely new lectionary that uses different readings on different occasions than what we have at present and, and what we've used since 1969, when the current lectionary came into usage within the Roman Catholic Church, following the reform of the liturgy from the Second Vatican Council. But there hasn't been any official move to reform the lectionary as yet. I think some people who are crit critics of the current lectionary would be happy to see lots of things changed. Um, but, you know, there's no move at that point at any point so far for a major revision of the lectionary, which would be a monumental task, but perhaps worth considering when we've gotten over the missile, <laughs> which took a lot of energy from people. We find the origins of lectionaries in the first century practices of the Jewish synagogues, where the custom was a continuous reading of the scriptures. And it's very likely that the earliest Christians read the scriptures in a similar way to their Jewish brothers and sisters at their communal gatherings. You can see in the photograph there that we have a Torah scroll um, and a, a pointer where there's probably a technical name for that, but I don't have it on my, my lips at the moment to tell you. But the, the reader there is pointing to where he is following in, in that scroll. And this is sort of a modern um, photograph of what was probably the practice in the first century synagogues, where they're reading those scrolls and they're following through and it's a continuous reading. So that's the sort of patterning that we had when we were members of that Jewish tradition in the synagogues prior to the breach between the Jewish Christians and the rest of the Jewish community when we formed our own Christian communities. But we took some of these practices along with us when we left, and this is one of them. Um, it's, it's very likely, as I said, that the earliest Christians read the scriptures in a very similar way to their Jewish brothers and sisters. Martin Connell, who's a wonderful liturgist, explains that the shape of the lectionary comes from an ancient church practice of lexio continua, continuous reading, um, a Latin term that describes the successive reading through books of the Bible from Sunday to Sunday. So that's part of our pattern and it's been there right from the very beginning. As the liturgical year developed, certain readings were read on particular feasts. So especially the resurrection, you would have the, the stories of, you know, the empty tomb being discovered read on the resurrection. Um, when people were preparing for baptism, particular readings were seen to be appropriate to be read on that occasion. When we were commemorating saints or martyrs, as there were very many in the early centuries of the church, when we were marking particular seasons of the agricultural year as well, there would be particular readings that we felt were appropriate to be read on those occasions and when we were marking specific historical events also. So the early communities of Christians started to mark out in their manuscripts where the start of these readings would be and where the end of these readings would be and that little indication is a little excerpt that we call a pericope. So the pericopes would be indicated and you'd have little marks in the margin there in this in the manuscript to say that this one was read on this particular occasion. There's a lot more history to the development of the lectionary but those little markings in those earliest manuscripts would then have been taken out of there and excerpted and made into separate books, which eventually become the lectionaries that we have today. Um, so it's it's quite an interesting history. We'll, we might have a little bit of time to go into a bit more of it in the next few weeks, but we'll we'll leave it there at the moment and turn our attention to the thing that you cannot talk about the lectionary without talking about, which is, of course, the liturgical year. 
now. This is, of course, the Christian celebration of time, how we understand time to have become Christianized. Um, the Christians over the in the first few centuries um, did engage in seasonally related activities, both within the church and outside of the church. And they did gradually develop this Christian understanding of time, whereby they began to see all of time as graced by God. And as time passed, they realized that because Christ was not returning as soon as they thought he would, because the early Christians thought he would be coming back very soon, that didn't happen. Time kept going and we didn't have Christ returning yet. But they wanted to mark the various seasons of Christ's life um, and also model their own lives on the pattern of his Paschal mystery. And this is how we get the development of the liturgical year. What I've got on this on the slide there for you is that by about 600, the year 600, we had a pretty clear structure of the liturgical year. It, they, they developed it fairly quickly over, over history. Um, we, we started out with these seasonally related activities, what was going on in the rest of their lives, they would sort of see as um, echoing aspects of Christ's life, or they would say, well, he must have been born at some particular time. So when do we think that was? And so they start out sort of working on the our celestial calendar and the um, uh, the movement of the stars and all sorts of things that are going on in nature and also seem to be indicating that something special is happening in terms of God. So we get the Christianization of time and we get this temporal cycle, so a, a cycle of time whereby the life of Christ is commemorated by the church and other ferias. Now a ferrier is, is a day of the week other than Sunday. When we mention Sunday, we have to say that that would be the very the very first feast, if you like, the very first celebration of the liturgical year, because it's the day of the resurrection. So that's the very first Christian feast, if you like. And then all the others develop around that. Um, the other thing that develops alongside the temporal cycle is the sanctural cycle. So this is the feasts of saints. Um, we get the commons of saints, the various masses that are prayed um, for various different saints and the memorials of those Christians who have died as martyrs, who have died as virgins, all sorts of other saints that are very important um, enter into this sanctuary cycle and they get commemorated over time. And it's interesting because the sanctuary cycle hasn't stopped developing. Um, if you pay attention to what happens in the Vatican, you'll see that almost every year we have new saints added to the calendar. Now, they might be local calendar saints or they might be universal calendar. Universal being the whole world celebrates these ones because they're so significant. Local calendar saints can be ones that are particularly significant, like our saint yesterday, Saint Mary MacKillop. Um, was celebrated here as a solemnity and also in New Zealand, though not as a solemnity. But she's so she's very important in this part of the world, but not necessarily in Mexico. So they won't necessarily be marking her, um, her, her day as yesterday. As I said, the main structure of the liturgical year is in place by about the year 600. And you can see it here, This all of these feasts existed um, by about the year 600. We already had Advent, those four weeks of preparation um, prior to Christmas. We had no, December the 25th identified as the Nativity of Christ. We had the octave of that Nativity. So the very biggest feasts, and we'll talk about these a little bit more, the solemnities are so big that they go beyond the boundaries of a single day. So we have an octave, we have eight days to celebrate Christmas. January the 6th, the Epiphany is also there, present. And then we have a period of ordinary time. Now this fluctuates a little bit, we'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, but we have six Sundays or so after Epiphany in the year 600, and then leading up to the Annunciation on March 25th, and then the Paschal cycle is there. You can actually see that the date of Easter um, it means that a whole lot of other dates get recognised. So Septuagesima, 70 days before Easter, is a particular feast in 600, um, marked by Septuagesima Sunday. Sexagesima, 60 days before Easter, is marked as Sexamagesima. Yeah, it's a hard word to say. Sexagesima Sunday, there it is. You've got to have your teeth in for that one. And Quinquagesima, 50 days before Easter. So Easter is really important for determining all these other feasts that relate to it. The season of Lent is there. So we have Ash Wednesday um, celebrated 
before we, we or at the very start of Lent. Then Paschal time is apparent in the year 600. We have Holy Week identified. We have Palm Sunday being celebrated. The Triduum, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, um, the Easter Vigil, Easter Saturday and Easter Sunday. And then, of course, 40 days after Easter, you have Ascension, 50 days after Easter, Pentecost, and then the rest of the time being ordinary time. So it's interesting to see how well established the, the, the cycle of time and marking and Christianizing time is by that period. There is a whole lot more <laughs> that can be said about the liturgical year, um, but this is essentially how it looks today. So we, we can still see those main times within that liturgical year. Now, back to the lectionary. We have to look at the liturgical year because the liturgical year um, is what guides the choice of the readings that we find in the lectionary that are associated with each of these feasts, each of these solemnities, each of the memorials and each of the Sundays of ordinary time that make up the lectionary. So we can't talk about the lectionary without knowing something about the liturgical year. Both of them are really big topics. We'll just you know, explore what we can in these days together. But the lectionary, as I said earlier, is that ordered collection of readings for proclamation within Catholic liturgies. Now we have three volumes making up our lectionary in Australia. The reason that I make a point of saying that is because the US version of the lectionary has four volumes. So we've truncated them into three. So you've got to be careful when you're reading documents and, and um, commentaries on the lectionary from the United States, especially if they are talking about volume three um, or volume two, you have to to know exactly which one they're talking about because we have a different sort of system of arranging our lectionary which is one of the reasons we wanted to adapt the US books that came to us as celebrating the lectionary so that in fact they rep they they reflect and incorporate our lectionary which is a little bit different from what the US has so it's only three volumes the first volume is Sundays and the proper of seasons Second volume is weekdays and the proper of saints and the commons. And the third volume is rituals, various needs, votive masses and masses for the dead. So we'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. But our lectionary in its three volumes, if we look at the entirety of the Bible, and we look at how much of it's actually in our lectionary, it's not very much. So about 90% of the gospels are covered, which is pretty good. About 55% of the rest of the New Testament. So there's quite a lot of the New Testament that we don't hear about when we hear the readings proclaimed in mass. And only about 13% of the Old Testament, which is not very much given how big it is. What's interesting though, is that prior to Vatican II, there was no Old Testament reading at all included in the mass. So 13% is an improvement. <laughs> and we do get, you know, at least some taste of what's going on in, in the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures as they are known. But the church uses lectionaries because it is a comprehensive way to try and get through much of the Bible within the three year period um, where we run through all of those readings that are in the lectionary. The Bible translation that is currently used in Australia is the Jerusalem Bible translation, not the New Jerusalem Bible and not yet the revised New Jerusalem Bible, but just the Jerusalem Bible. So that's the one we use. Um, other English speaking countries use different translations from us. And so we need to make sure that we're actually using the right one when we're quoting from our lectionary because the Jerusalem Bible is the one that's in our lectionary. Now, the Australian Catholic Bishops Conference is currently beginning work on a new lectionary, which a lot of people will be hurrahing about because um, a lot of our lectionaries are quite old and they're falling apart and you can't buy a new one. So until we get this new lectionary, um, we just kind of have to keep repairing the old ones and using them and treating them with as much respect as we can. Um, the translation that the bishops have decided to go with, unless they change their minds again, fingers crossed they won't, is the revised New Jerusalem Bible translation. The good thing about that is that to the ear, it will sound fairly much the same, um, a little, a, a few differences, but much of it will be the same sort of patterning we're used to hearing from the current translation of the Bible. So when it comes in, it'll be a little bit of an adjustment, but not as big an adjustment as it might be if we'd gone for another translation. And there are lots of them out there to choose from. But the bishops have sought really good advice um, from lots of scripture scholars and this is the one that they've decided to go with. 
All right, so volume one, let's delve into that a little bit. This one is for the Sunday lectionary. And um, as is noted in its general introduction, the lectionary is arranged according to a three year cycle and it's based on three of the New Testament Gospels. Now, anybody who's done any scripture will kind of look at this and go, hmm, they haven't quite got the order right, have they? If you're going chronologically. So Mark is the first of the Gospels to have been written. Late 60s, around 70 is when they, they date Mark. Um, and Matthew is not prior to that, Matthew follows Mark. However, tradition has it that Matthew is year A, Mark is year B, and Luke is year C. So you'll see that we're currently in year C, we're currently in Luke, and at the in Advent this year, at the end of November, early December, we will shift over to year A, and we'll be with Matthew then through until Advent of 2023, when Mark takes over. John turns up in every year. So John is, is quite different from the other synoptic gospels. And he turns up in year B in quite a quite a large way because Mark is, is only 16 chapters long. So there's not enough of Mark unless we have really, really short readings to fill out the entire liturgical year. So we fill in a bit of the Mark year with, with some gospel of John material. But John is also used in Lent and in Easter quite a lot in the other Matthew and Luke years as well. So he turns up everywhere. He doesn't get overlooked by any means. So that's volume one, Sundays. And then volume two gives us the weekday lectionary. Now, given that many school liturgies, and I know a lot of you are from school communities here, a lot of our school liturgies take place during weekdays. And so it's really important that you have an understanding of both the Sunday lectionary and the lectionary for weekdays. So the lectionary for weekdays has two volumes um, or two, you know, year one and year two, and they're alternated depending on which year we are in. So year one is odd numbered years and year two is even numbered years. So that's kind of a little way to remember when we're in an even numbered year, we're using year two, when we're in an odd numbered year, we're using year one. So next year will be in year one, following year will be in year two. Um, the weekday lectionary in Australia also has the proper of saints included in it, uh, and this provides the readings for the celebration of the various saints that we remember throughout the liturgical year. And it also provides us with the readings for commons when we're celebrating um, the feast days of Mary or the saints who that don't have assigned readings to them. Okie dokie, so that's volume two. And then volume three has lots of interesting things in it. You may not have delved into this one too much, but it's very interesting. It's got uh, ritual masses. So this would be the readings that we use for the celebration of sacraments, the rites of religious profession, and a various other bits and pieces in there. The masses for various needs and occasions. So if you are celebrating um, a mass for peace or a mass for the sick or a mass for Thanksgiving, something like that, um, there are lots of options in there for masses for various needs and then the votive masses so with with the permission of the bishop you can request that a votive mass of the holy spirit is celebrated or a mass of the sacred heart we used a votive mass of the sacred heart earlier on this year um, when acu welcomed our new chancellor we had a beautiful mass in um, saint stephen's cathedral in brisbane and the new chancellor has a bit of an association with the sacred heart and an affinity for the sacred heart so archbishop coleridge was very happy for us to celebrate a votive mass of the sacred heart so there are particular readings that are associated with that. So it means that your, your regular readings that are slated for that particular day in ordinary time get pushed aside, they're not used, and you use the readings for that votive mass on that particular occasion. Got to be done with permission though. And then the masses for the dead um, as needed are included in here also. So those three volumes, lots and lots of readings to choose from amongst all of those. So it's really important to have a sense of the different types of celebrations that we mark in the liturgical year and the lectionary. And there are four different types of occasions that we actually do mark. So our Sundays and weekdays in ordinary time, as you'd expect, and then we have solemnities, feasts and memorials. And these are some really interesting occasions. So they're very special liturgical occasions that are ranked according to their importance. So they're sort of like gold, silver and bronze medals, if you like. The gold medals are the solemnities, the uh, silver medals are the feasts and the bronze medals are the memorials. They're just differently ranked in importance. 
Um, so the unit, these come from the, this information, not the medal information, but the rest of it comes from the universal norms on the liturgical year and the general Roman calendar, which explains each of these different types of celebration. When I first started reading that document, I had difficulty because it was fairly dry and um, I needed it explained to me. And then I could go back and read it a little bit with a little bit more understanding. So it, it can be a bit dry when you read it for the first time. But it's important to understand that solemnities are the most important days of the liturgical year. It won't surprise you to know that these are Easter, Christmas, Pentecost, Immaculate Conception, Christ the King, All Souls, and some saints. So yesterday, St. Mary of the Cross in Australia is a solemnity. We also have St. Patrick and a few others that are really important to us here. Solemnities are those principal days of the calendar, and they're so important that they begin the night before. So they begin with evening prayer on the preceding day. And some of them are so important that they even have their own vigil mass, which is different readings and different prayers prayed on that evening the night before than you get prayed on the actual day. So Pentecost, for example, has its own vigil mass with separate readings from the readings that are, that are actually prayed on Pentecost Day itself. So that's how important the solemnities are. And Easter and Christmas, as I said earlier, are just so important that they can't be contained to one 24-hour period. <laughs> so they get an octave. They have eight days um, to be celebrated, which is wonderful. So solemnities, the gold medals. The feasts are the next important, the silver medalists. Now, these are interesting. So these are ones that celebrate a mystery or a title of Christ. So, for example, the Transfiguration or Mary, like the Assumption, or a saint of a special significance, specific significance, like the um, chief apostles. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John the Evangelist, or some of the other apostles get a feast, um, or a saint of particular importance. Actually, Patrick's not, she, he should be on the solemnities list in Australia. He's, um, he's actually a solemnity on March the 17th. But the feasts are celebrated within the limits of the natural day. So sunrise to sunset, they don't have any vigil, they don't have um, evening prayer, but they do have proper prayers prayers that are specific to the, those particular occasions. Um, they do have two readings and the Gloria. So a first reading, a second reading, responsorial psalm, gospel, and, and we sing the Gloria as well. So they're quite important. The third category is memorials. Um, and these are usually saints that are celebrated, but we can also be celebrating an aspect of Christ or Mary. So the holy name of Jesus, for example, is one, or the immaculate heart of Mary is a different one. So aspects of Christ or Mary. Some of them are marked as obligatory, which means that the priests must celebrate that particular mass on that particular occasion using the prayers and the readings that are designated for that occasion. Um, and also celebrating the liturgy of the hours. Um, you must celebrate the hours that are associated with that memorial rather than regular weekday, weekday prayers. The other ones are optional. And I've included some of these in the Celebrating the Lectionary books, even though they're optional, because they're really interesting. And here is where you find a lot of great variety in terms of the kinds of saints that we are celebrating as part of our tradition. You don't have to celebrate them, but I think it's actually quite interesting to do that because then you get to explore the life story of some of these incredibly inspirational people. Um, and it's definitely worth investigating them further, especially if you're trying to encourage students to take an interest in some of the, the great heroes of our faith. You can find them in these optional memorials. So it's worth celebrating those and having a bit of a look at them. They're generally not quite so well known um, or their occasions are slightly less significant. One of the things you really need to work with is the Ordo, um, which is the annual calendar that contains the details for how Mass is to be celebrated on every day of the liturgical year. Um, so anybody who is a liturgist will we'll see if I can get the camera to recognise it, so have an Ordo. Um, anybody who works in a parish will have to use the Ordo because you've got to know exactly what's going on in terms of what colour the church has to be decorated in, what colour the vestments need to be, what readings you need to be proclaiming on that particular day, uh, and all sorts of other information. I've actually got a, a, um, a page from the auto this week on the screen there, and you can see I've got two little arrows. One of them up the top is pointing to year C. That's what we are in this year. That's our liturgical year. And the second, the two refers to the weekday lectionary number two this year. And I've highlighted down in the, the box there at the bottom of the page, 
um, where it is today. So this is a, the lectionary for today. And you can see that the liturgical colour is green if you are celebrating the weekday, Tuesday of Ordinary Time, week 19. Um, the readings are listed there, or down the bottom you can see red. You can see an optional memorial, um, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. So if you're interested in finding out about her, you could celebrate her optional memorial on this particular day if you wanted to. Okay, so a few, few more little details here um, just to, to blow that up a fraction so you can see it. You can see Mary of the Cross from yesterday and then today we have either weekday ordinary time 19 to Tuesday or Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. I'll keep moving. When we have our masses on Sunday and major feasts, we have three readings. Our first reading from the Old Testament except during Easter time when we read from Acts. Responsorial Psalm is generally from the Book of Psalms, but sometimes from biblical canticles on occasion. Second reading is mostly from the New Testament, from Paul's epistles, sometimes other New Testament epistles, sometimes the Book of Revelation. Um, it's always the New Testament, I misspoke there. And the Gospel acclamation is generally, usually a biblical quote. Sometimes it's a verse that's been made up by the church to fit the occasion as well. And then our Gospel, depending on what liturgical year we are in, is either A, B, C, Matthew, Mark or Luke. And then John used uh, across all three years. And normally there is a thematic connection between that first reading and the gospel. They've tried to do that in creating the lectionary. And the second reading is usually unrelated, but it follows along from week to week. We get that Lexio continua tradition, semi-continuous pattern throughout the season. The weekday masses only have two readings attached to them. The first reading, again, a semi-continuous alternate, reading alternating between the Old Testament and the New Testament in that two yearly cycle, year one or year two. Responsorial Psalm from the Book of Psalms or sometimes Canticles on a two year cycle again, Gospel Acclamation and then the Gospel. So it's the same in years one and two, but we have semi continuous readings from Matthew, Mark and Luke in that order. Sorry, Mark, Matthew and Luke in that order. Um, so a little bit different between the weekday lectionary and the Sunday lectionary there. Now, I'll take you back a fraction for a second. Um, what we are talking about, I've given you all that background on lectionary and all that background on liturgical year, not because I enjoy talking about them, which I do, but because it's really essential to help you to understand these books that we're meeting and exploring together, um, which are celebrating the lectionary. And essentially what these books are is a chance for us to, to, to explore and investigate and become aware of the catechetical opportunities that exist for us by studying the lectionary and working with the lectionary alongside celebrating with the lectionary. So studying and celebrating alongside each other so that they both can inform how we live our lives. Ultimately, that's what this is about, living a Christian life, exploring one's faith so that one can live it out as fully as possible. So these books are essentially catechetical books. Now, some people get a little worried about that term. I wouldn't worry about it. Catechesis is a, is a really ancient notion within the church. It comes from a Greek word, kata, meaning down, echein, meaning to sound. So when you put those together in katakein, catechesis in English, you get to sound down. And what that means is that our tradition is sounded down the ages. We pass it on from teacher to student, from parent to child, grandparent to child. The tradition is sounded down and this is what catechesis is. It's essentially just teaching and learning, sounding down all of these important concepts within our faith. Lectionary based catechesis then is the sort of teaching that uses the contents of the lectionary as a guide and a scaffold for exploring the major themes of Christian belief. Um, we link what students are learning about in class directly with what is being celebrated in the liturgy on the Sunday and sometimes on weekdays during each week of the liturgical year and that's what these books do. Um, I put a little quote there from the Directory for Masses with Children which I think is really important for us to keep in mind. It says a fully Christian life is inconceivable without participation in the liturgical services in which the faithful gathered into a single assembly celebrate the Paschal Mystery. So it's essentially saying we can't have a fully Christian life unless we celebrate together. So liturgy is terribly important in terms of living the Christian life and nourishing the Christian life. 
the approach taken in these books to lectionary based catechesis is to allow the liturgy to be a key source for religious education and also for catechetical education. So we're moving from the classroom into liturgical celebration and then, of course, into life. So that's the, the purpose of these particular books bringing the scriptures to life in engaging in active ways and linking the classroom learning to church worship, to family and community life, living out the faith ideally. So these books, these celebrating the lectionary books, year A, year B, year C, have been designed to provide faith formation based on the lectionary and on the liturgical year, which is why we just spent the last half hour or so exploring these notions together really important. So for every Sunday of the liturgical year, for the solemnities, for the holy days of obligation, for select feasts and for national days of prayer, we have provided for you in these books a 15 to 20 minute session um, that requires minimal preparation on the facilitator's part, which should make you cheer. Anything that makes your life easy should make you cheer. Um, and these are designed to supplement your core religious education curriculum with lectionary based catechesis. Um, this sort of faith formation helps students to connect the word of God that they encounter in the liturgy with daily life and it aims to help them to become much more comfortable talking about their faith and living out their faith in action. That's the ideal. That's where we hope to get. So they do specifically work to link school and home and parish life on a weekly basis. And if you were to use one of these sessions in a school RE class each week, um, you can prepare students to attend Sunday Mass by using that session where they will hear the gospel in, in church that they've heard in your class that week. They'll already be familiar with it and the ideas that they'll encounter in it will become more deeply embedded when they encounter those ideas in the liturgy as well. And for those who can't attend Sunday Mass for whatever reason, this is a wonderful opportunity for them to be able to be exposed to those big ideas of the Sunday Mass. And it keeps them in touch with what's going on in the parish community when they can't attend. And that's the reality for a number of people. So giving them the chance through school to experience this is a wonderful gift to them and it connects them into the parish when they can get there. I thought it would be really helpful for us to go through one entire entry um, from Celebrating the Lectionary to explain what it, what's in it, how it works, and how it can be used and adapted. So each of the sessions is designed as a prayer and learning event that is based on the gospel themes for the particular week or the occasion that you're exploring together. So here we go. Here's an example. Anzac Day. Um, Anzac Day is one of our national days of prayer, a national day of remembrance. And you can see that I've broken up the pages into little snapshots so you can see them a bit more close up. Um, but you can see the listing from Lectionary Volume 2 where we have the readings, all of the readings are listed there. And these readings are from the Australian lectionary. So we have the Psalm numbering system from the Australian lectionary, which is different from the American lectionary and the little pericopes, the little snatches of each of these, these books of the Bible are particular to our lectionary. They differ a little bit from the US one. So all of those had to be carefully made sure that we've got our Australian ones. So you have um, a main idea, serving God and country is what is being explored in this particular um, occasion of Anzac Day. And the focus for this particular iteration of Anzac Day, because it appears in all three volumes, is to fight for peace. So let's explore further. In every one of these sessions, you have a leader's context. So if you've kind of not got a lot of time, which is the case for a lot of us, um, you can have a look at this little leader's context and it will remind you of what the key ideas are to be explored here. Um, I won't go through it in detail because we, we don't have a huge amount of time, but we've got a focus there which will help you have a quick read of that before you run your class and, and you'll be okay, you'll know what you're on about. We also have a focus on church teaching. So if you are wanting to know what the basis is for the approach taken to each of these sessions, it is very much on strong doctrinal teaching. So you'll see lots of references to the catechism and to other official doctrinal texts. There's a whole list of the texts that are quoted in each of the volumes at the start of each of the volumes so that you're very aware of what documents we're quoting and you can go and read them more, uh, more of them if you're interested in that. So it'll focus on church teaching relevant to this particular topic and occasion. 
And then you'll have a liturgical calendar connection. So of course, as I said, the liturgical year is very much associated with the lectionary. You cannot have one without the other. And this is a little invitation to help your students to find where in the liturgical calendar we are. Um, and the Year of Grace calendar is designed to work in concert with this, these particular books. Each of these uh, sessions begins with the ritual and it's really important that you, you take great care in the way that the ritual is done, that you take it seriously, that you ask the students to be very reverent when they are standing to welcome Christ in the gospel because he's present where two or three are gathered in his name and he is there speaking to us through this gospel. So we make the sign of the cross together as we stand and we sing, ideally, the gospel acclamation together. You'll see in the books that in Lent, we have the Lenten gospel acclamations, the different one across each of the three years, year A, year B, year C. So students are exposed to all three Lenten gospel acclamations as we go through Lent on the three years and then ordinary time or Anzac Day such as this one, we've just got the regular Alleluia's there. And you have the gospel there. Now, this is the gospel that is taken word for word from the lectionary for mass as we use it in Australia. Um, it is not the lectionary for masses with children because these books are designed for years five through eight. So upper primary, lower secondary school, which means that they are not under the age of 10. If they were under the age of 10, you could use the lectionary for masses with children, but ch students in year five are above the age of 10. So they, the church considers that they are well capable of experiencing and listening to the readings as they are proclaimed in the Sunday assembly. Um, and look, if they don't understand absolutely everything they're hearing, that's okay. This is what these, these sessions are about is explaining to them um, any questions they might have, you know, give them a chance to explore. And we unpack these major ideas that they could come across in these readings together in the next section. So you have the gospel there, exactly from our Australian lectionary, and then you have a reflection. So this uh, won't, obviously we don't have time to read this, but it, it looks at reflecting on the fight for peace and how important peace is and fighting for peace. And then you have a couple of activities. So within your 15 to 20 minute session, you start off with the sign of the cross and you move through your reflection after the gospel. And then you can have a couple of activities. You can do one this year and then one next year, if you like, you don't have to attempt to do both of them this year. Um, there's a flag ceremony that you might like to explore with your students and um, creating a holy medal to, to mark Anzac Day is another one of the activities that we've come up with for this particular occasion. Um, and then there's a take home sheet. Now, this is where we try to link school to church to family. Um, a lot of parents are uncomfortable, perhaps talking about faith matters with their children. Um, and this can be a way to give them something to do, give them, give them some words that they can use, give them some questions they can ask, give them some activities that they can do that are faith based, that are based on what the church is looking at in the liturgical year on this particular occasion. Um, and, you know, designed to help them connect with their children on matters of faith which is helpful. There's no requirement that they do anything with these sheets that you're encouraged to offer them, offer to the students to take home, but you never know. Some people might take them up and be really enriched by them. So all of the scripture readings are listed there again for parents. And then there's a little prayer like we prayed at the start of our session tonight that they might like to pray with their children. And some little questions or, you know, did you know some information here? So often this is, um, this particular information is, is statistics about um, how many Australians and New Zealanders were in, involved in the wars um, and how many were taken as prisoners and all that kind of stuff. So it's just information on Anzac Day and the sacrifice that a lot of our men and women made um, for our countries. Then there are some conversation questions that the parents might like to engage with, with their children or with each other. Um, and then some suggestions um, to put their faith into action. Again, these are just suggestions. You just throw them out and see what happens. So that would be an entire entry. So for every Sunday of the liturgical year and for all of the solemnities and feasts um, that we have included, um, you have all of this for each of those. 
Now, you might want to know what some of the adaptations were that were made to the original US version. How is the Australian version different? Well, it's all completely aligned to the Australian liturgical calendar. We use the Australian lectionary translation, which is different from the American. They use the New American Bible. We use the Jerusalem Bible. So all of our readings are from our, our translation. We have aligned all of the pericopes, psalm numbers, lectionary volume numbering, um, and I mentioned that we use the lectionary for mass with these upper primary, lower secondary students at which these books are aimed. The seventh Sunday of Easter is not celebrated in Australia because that becomes Ascension Sunday for us. The Americans still celebrate the Ascension on Thursday, so they have the seventh Sunday of Easter, but you won't find that in the Australian books because we don't use that. We do have additional sessions, about 30 different saints across the three books that are particular to, some of them are particular to Australia and New Zealand um, and solemnities and, and national days of prayer that are particular to Australia and New Zealand and a whole range of different saints. So we've tried to include some really interesting ones, Vietnamese martyrs and Josephine Bakita and all sorts of interesting ones that maybe are, are newer, some of them are newer and some of them haven't really had much attention paid to them as well as some really ancient ones as well who have very interesting stories. So the saints are well worth exploring. I changed some of the language, some of the colloquial expressions um, and some of the cultural examples and seasonal references that were in the US entries into more uh, references and language and colloquial expressions and cultural examples that reflected our context a little bit more closely. So we're not talking about summer holidays in ordinary time because for ordinary time for us, it's winter. So things like that have been changed. And then the books have been rearranged so that they follow the liturgical year rather than the US school year, which is is how the books came to us. So there's been quite a bit of adaptation happening in these books. So who are these books for? Well, they are for classroom teachers. Many of you are classroom teachers. They are for catechists who are working um, uh, as catechists in schools and parishes. They are for people who are preparing children for Christian initiation. And they are for those who run children's liturgy of the word during Sunday Mass. So sometimes in big parishes, you'll have a large group of young children go with their catechist or with their leader, and they go and read the gospel in a separate group from the main assembly and have a children's liturgy of the word. So these entries and these books are very useful for those contexts as well. Clergy also might find them quite helpful if you're um, working with young students and you're not quite sure how to pitch um, the information or your, your homily at a, a level that will connect with them. These provide a very good example for you um, to understand how to do that because they are, they are pitched exactly at that level. I feel we're running out of time and we're not going to be able to quite finish everything I had prepared. So what I might do is stop at that point. We have a little bit more information to go, but I think we've got we've got more time next week and more time in the weeks to follow. Um, but I might stop my PowerPoint presentation there, David, and throw back to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, and look, you know, hundreds of people are on this uh, Zoom tonight, hundreds of people, many hundreds of people have registered and many hundreds of people are on the Zoom tonight. I apologise for that um, technical difficulty at the start when uh, we were finding it difficult to um, register or add chat, but um, uh, I think that's all working. There were some people who came in late to the session. So if I could just say, if you are seeking accreditation from ACU for uh, professional development purposes or um, hours, um, then please in the chat function, if you could include your name and your email, preferably those that you registered for the sessions with, um, put those in the chat so that I can record that you've been on the call tonight. Um, and we do have a couple of questions, um, aside from the fact that uh, many people are saying I can't um, I, I, I can't uh, open the chat. Um, um, uh, Don Rita had a question um, early on, and I think we may have touched on it anyway, Claire, which was, um, might it be worth mentioning the children's lectionary, which I think we did later on. Um, so Don Rita, if, um, if Claire hasn't answered your question tonight, just let us know and we will um, answer it next week, perhaps, uh, or clarify it. 
um, further. Um, is the new, uh, Zaldine asks, is the new revised Bible being translated from the original Hebrew and Greek again? I don't know, to be honest. Um, it, it, they're not doing a new translation. It's a pre, it's an existing translation. Um, they would not be translating it from the Latin anymore. I don't think that would be um, considered acceptable. They would certainly be translating it in light of looking at the original languages so the original hebrew the original greek um, and then they would also be looking at the tradition of translation that has been utilized in the jerusalem bible i don't think they'd be making a fresh translation directly from scratch so they're adapting um, the existing translation so it's a, revi a revision of the new jerusalem bible so it's a revised revised if you like jerusalem bible yep question about copyright permissions mm. <clears throat> Excuse me, I apologise. Does each child need to have a copy or is it permitted to copy activity sheets? Well, that might be a question for the publisher, David. <laughs> Probably more a question for me. Now, as a publisher, um, I would love every child to have a copy of the book, um, but I'm also a realist. Um, the books are designed um, to be able to be used by photocopying certain pages. You know, if... if if you're running particular activities with your um, with 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 your students and young people, um, it's easy if they've got a sheet of paper in front of them. Um, so that's uh, um, so that's good. And um, you know, <laughs> I, I hate to say that as a publisher. <laughs> most, most of the activities but, but let's be are really. Yeah, most of the activities are designed for very minimal preparation um, for very low um, resourced classrooms. So, you know, scissors, paper, pens, you know, that kind of stuff. They're very simple. They recognize, we recognize that you don't have a lot of time to, um, to engage in these activities. So they're not meant to be exceedingly long instruction lists, you know, that you can read them and you can say to the students, okay, you do this, then you do this, then you do this and off you go. Um, so yeah, they're, they're very straightforward. They're very, they're designed without high tech involved so if you're in a, in a place that doesn't have um you know a lot of technical equipment you don't need that yep. they're very accessible yep there is there are some other questions um uh perhaps for me um that surround is there a plan to create digital versions of these books um uh, i would say yes there is um but we're some way away from it our our well my desire um was to get the three books done as quickly as we possibly could over the three the last three years um get those out into the australian um uh, community um, because i felt that there was a real need for these resources um in schools and in parishes um as we move um uh you know, as we move into a more digital realm, we will certainly consider how we can make these books available in a digital format that works for your schools, for your students, for your parishes, um, and for your young people. So uh, uh, please bear with us. There's another question very quickly, and I'm mindful of time. Um, the Feast of the Assumption is a holiday of obligation. Yes. Why is this a silver medal feast day? and not a gold medal feast day, Claire. Um, actually, I think I should have had that in a gold medal. And I, I saw that as it went past and I went, mm, I think I'm wrong on that. So, yeah, I that's think you're right. right. We forgive you. Yeah, that's right. We forgive you. But yeah. um, Lewis has picked that up. So no, thanks, thank Lewis. you, Lewis. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's fine. <laughs> um, now, I'm very conscious of time. Um, uh, so, uh, Claire, thank you very much uh, for tonight. Um Please support Claire's work by visiting garrett.com and purchasing one or all of the Celebrating the Lectionary books. A three book set is currently on sale and details of how you could purchase them will be included in the email that contain, contains tonight's video and reminder emails will send to you next week when Claire will be joined by Elizabeth Fort from the Brisbane Catholic Education Office. Alternatively, if you don't want to buy directly off Garrett, please contact your local bookshop and support them. In these challenging times, local bookstores need your help now more than ever. Um, please consider buying local. Um, on that note, um, I will thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, thank you very much uh, to everybody who has um, uh, 
uh, noted that they wish to be um, uh, accredited. Um, and so we've got a process that will advise you um, in coming weeks about the accreditation. So um, please bear with us. Look for the video um, in the next, uh, well, in the next week, hopefully we'll have that to you. So you can um, uh uh, can review the insights from Claire because she was running at 100 miles an hour, I think. Um, so everybody, please, thank you very much. Um, uh, from all of us at Garrett, um, many thanks to you, many blessings to you all, and good night.